I want to show you how to calculate expected return and standard deviation for a two-stock portfolio um, using Excel. So before we get around to doing that, let's just look at the equations here. The expected return of a portfolio that has only two stocks, A and B, is a weighted average of the two. So it's the percentage you put in A times the expected return of A plus the percentage you put in B times the expected return in B. And if you added WA plus WB, it should add up to 1 or 100%. Now, when you calculate variance, you can't just average the two variances. Or if you calculated standard deviation, you can't just average the two standard deviations. Why? Because if the securities don't move in lockstep with one another, that when one goes up, the other one always goes up by the same amount, you're going to get some diversification benefits. You may have heard that term, don't put all your eggs in one basket. right? If you buy Microsoft stock and Microsoft has a bad um, year, a bad return, well, Ford might do well, or Apple might do well, or General Foods might do well. So that might offset some of those losses. So the variance for a portfolio is equal to the percentage you put in A squared times the variance of A plus the percentage you put in B squared times the variance of B plus two times the percent in A times the percent in B times the covariance between A and B. Covariance is a measure of how securities move. Do they move together? Do they move in opposite directions? If you get a positive covariance, it means that they move together. Okay, perhaps not all the time, but most of the time they tend to go up together and they tend to go down together. If you get a covariance that's negative, it tends they tend to move in opposite directions. So usually when A goes up, B goes down. You know, when B goes down, a goes up, right? They move in opposite directions, you know, one up, one down. Not all the time. There can be cases where they both go up or they both go down or one goes up and the other one doesn't move, but usually they're moving somewhat in opposite directions. You can rewrite that same variance equation and you have the first parts are all the same and you, instead of putting covariance in, you put in the standard deviation of A times the standard deviation of B times the correlation coefficient between A and B. Correlation is essentially a scaled covariance. That is, it's between minus 1 and plus 1. Minus 1 means perfect negative correlation. It means that if A goes up, B always goes down and proportionately by the same amount. So if you tell me how much A went up, I'll tell you exactly how much B went down. If you tell me that A went down, then B will go up and I will tell you exactly how much it went up. If it's plus one, that's perfect positive correlation. That means they both go up and down exactly in lockstep. So perhaps A goes up by 1%, then B goes up by 2%. If uh, A goes down by 1%, B goes down by 2%. They always move exactly in the same proportions and in the same direction. In that case, you're not going to get any diversification benefit. It's like buying two shares of Microsoft stock, right? They move exactly together. When, one, when the price of one goes up, the price of the other also goes up. Now, if you have a correlation coefficient that's less than plus one, you'll get some diversification benefits. Okay? Um, you may not be able to eliminate all of the risk, but you can eliminate some of it by holding um, securities that don't move exactly together. And if you want the standard deviation, you just take the square root of the variance. Usually when we graph things or when we do calculations, we look at the standard deviation. And the reason for that is, even though variance essentially tells us the same thing, it's in the same units as expected return. In this case, it'll be in percent terms. The variance is in different units because you're squaring all these terms. It's in percent 
squared, those are the units, you know, like square feet, you know, if you happen to look at a tile on the floor and it's one foot by one foot, you would say it's one square foot, all right? So it's in a different unit, so it's, it's somewhat not comparable, you know, when you're doing the graphing or it doesn't work quite as well. All right, so let's take a look at a numerical example here. So I've put the equation back here in case you've, uh, you know, in case you want to reference it. But let's look at this example. We have an expected return of A is 8%. We have the expected return of B is 15%. The standard deviation of A is 3%. The standard deviation of B is 7%. And I'm going to assume right now that the correlation is zero. Okay, so not positive, not negative, just sort of sometimes A goes up, B goes down, sometimes A goes up, B does nothing. All right, they, they, there's no real relationship here. Now, you know that A and B have different risk return characteristics. A is safer. A has a lower expected return, but a lower level of risk. Okay, B has a better expected return, but a higher level of risk. Now, when you calculate this, and this is what I did here, is I calculated the expected return and standard deviation for different combinations of A and B. So those are the only two stocks in the portfolio. So I could have 100% in A and nothing in B, in which case the expected return and the standard deviation would be exactly what A has, right? 8% expected return and 3% standard deviation. Uh, because there is no B in the portfolio. If I had 100% of B and no A, so this is a percentage of A, I would have the expected return that B has and the standard deviation that B has. And you can see that, right? 15% and 7%. Now, the expected return is easy to calculate. It's just the percentage in A times the expected return for A plus the percentage in B times the expected return of B. And you can see that as we add more B, the risky asset to our portfolio, the expected return goes up, right? And 100% of B gives us the highest expected return. There's no surprise there. Okay, what's really interesting is, is that as we combine a and B into the portfolio, and here's the calculation I did for the standard deviation. I just put this equation in here. All right, this is the one I actually I use this one with the correlation coefficient. I just put that in there. It's the square root that gives us a standard deviation. And then if you sort of <coughs> work through it, you can see B14, the percent in A squared times um, the standard deviation of A, which is in what, C8 squared, right, plus the, percent, the um, percentage in B squared times the standard deviation squared, which gives us the variance, et cetera, et cetera. So I put in this formula right here, into here. What's really interesting when you look at this, we saw that the expected return just keeps going up, but here, this is really neat. Even though B is riskier, by adding a little bit, um, uh, by adding a little bit of B to A, we reduce the risk from 3% to 2.8714, and we get a higher expected return. And you can see here that at 90%, we have again a higher expected return. Right, the more B we have, the more the higher the expected return, but we have an even lower standard deviation or lower level of risk. And then here, when we get to 85% A and 15% of B, we get a uh, standard deviation of 2.7577, which at least as I've done it here is the lowest standard deviation we get. Now that doesn't mean that's the lowest risk absolutely, but based on the graph I've drawn, or based on the numbers I've used, the percentages here, that's the um, best we can do. And you can see it from this graph here. Here, if we had all only A, we would have 8% and 3%, right? 8% expected return, 3% standard deviation. But as we move along this graph, it bends backwards. 
we're getting a higher expected return and a lower level of risk. Moving to the left here means lower risk. Moving up means higher expected return. At some point, it gets over here where you're you're not getting quite as the same sort of trade-off. You're getting a higher expected return, but risk is starting to go up. All right, but risk is still you know um, unless you're a hundred percent in B, risk is still going to be lower than seven percent. Now let me show you something interesting here. So this is for a correlation of zero, right? You see it bends backwards a little bit. What if they're perfectly positively correlated? They move exactly together. What kind of result do you think you're going to get? Let's see. Let's type a one in here. This is the trade-off we get. We get a straight line trade-off. What does that mean? That means that essentially, sorry, there's no trade-off. There's no benefits from diversification. If you want less risk, then just buy A. If you want more risk and a higher expected return, buy B. And you, you can have some combination of the two, but it doesn't bend backwards. How about if they're perfectly negatively correlated? This is really interesting here. If they move exactly in opposite directions, we can get a portfolio that has no risk. Right? It's right here intersecting this y-axis. Right? So up here, so it looks like, what is that saying? 10.10% um, expected return and no risk. So if you can find two securities that move exactly in opposite directions, okay, very hard to do, um, you can actually build a portfolio that has zero risk. And again, you can fool around with this to see different um, combinations. Let's say we have minus uh, 0.5. Okay, you get it bending back pretty good, but it doesn't get to be risk-free. How about minus uh, 0.8? All right, there it bends back even farther. So the more the closer this is to negative one, the closer you can get to having a riskless portfolio. The closer you are to one means that there's no trade-off here. Okay, you can't, you don't get any reduction in risk from adding stock B to your portfolio. So this is a neat concept. It gives you a chance to sort of see risk and return trade-offs for um, different correlations, how they bend backwards, how the shape changes. Let's see if we put in 0.2, right? It's more, it's, it's uh, positive, but not highly positive. It won't bend back quite as much as it does with zero or a lower number. So if you ever have to do this or you want to conceptualize risk and return trade-off, um, Excel is an excellent way to do this.